this time the state of South Carolina calls Detective Laura Rutland. Thank you. Take a seat in the witness stand. State your name again. Spell your last name. My name is Laura Rutland, R U T L A N D. Good morning. Good morning. Are you nervous? Yes. Nobody's watching. <laughs> <laughs> you are Laura Rutland? I am. Please tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury about Laura Rutland, where you're from, uh, where you were born, where you lived, and a little bit of your background leading up to law enforcement, please, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. I was born in uh, Charleston, and South Carolina. When I was about six months old, my family moved back to England, where we were originally from. Lived there until I was about three or four years old. Came back to the United States. Uh, grew up in Somerville, South Carolina. Graduated from Somerville High School. Um, after I graduated, I was working as a dog groomer. Uh, met my would be my husband. We moved to um, Port Royal, South Carolina. He was in the Marine Corps, stationed at Paris Island at the time. Uh, then we moved to Bluffton. Um, we had decided. Um, I decided to pursue law enforcement. I've always been a true crime nerd um, into mysteries and things like that, so I decided to pursue law enforcement. Um, I graduated from the South Carolina Criminal Justice, Justice Academy in 2010 and was working at the Bluffton Police Department where I held various roles. Um, started on patrol, became a detective, then I was promoted to a supervisor where I supervised a patrol shift and then eventually supervised the detective unit at Bluffton PD. Uh, my husband and I decided we wanted a lot of kids. <laughs> so after I had my third baby, I decided to try a, my um, civilian job, um, get out of law enforcement for a little bit um, with a better schedule. So I briefly worked on Paris Island as a sexual assault victim advocate for the sexual assault um, response and prevention program. Uh, realized I missed law enforcement, so I wanted to get back, so um, especially investigations. Um, I first tried Beaufort Police Department, but it would take <coughs> several years for them to have an opening in criminal investigations. So then I came to the Colleton County Sheriff's Office where they were seeking um, experienced detectives. And so I joined Colleton County Sheriff's Office in September 2020, and February 2021 I was transferred to the Criminal Investigation Division, where I currently am now. I, my main focus is child crimes, which means um, children of sexual and physical abuse. Um, those are the, the cases that I predominantly work, as well as I'm a South Carolina um, ICAC task force member. And what that means is it's uh, Internet Crimes Against Children, and that's a task force that's partnership with the Attorney General's office. And we basically battle online pre child predators, um, child pornography, those types of cases. Um, we do rotate homicides in um, the detective division uh, among nine of us. At some point, did you work at Paris Island? I did, yes, sir. What, tell these folks what you did there. I was the sexual assault victim advocate for civilians on the base. And your training in law enforcement has been what, detective? It's been various things. It's, it's been uh, basic training to advanced training. Um, you name it, I've attended several advanced trainings hosted by other law enforcement agencies, state and federal. How many children do you have now? We have four. Okay. And uh, does your husband work? He does. Does he work at home? He does. Mm -hmm. uh, so you started full-time with Colleton in what year? 2020. Okay. And what was your role when you first started with Colleton County Sheriff's Department? Um, I started on patrol to familiarize myself with the county. And then did you work yourself or? Work out, but you become a detective. I did, yes. Okay. When was that? February 2021. On June 7th of 2021. Well, let me ask you before I get there. Where do you, not to pry, don't want the world to know, but they're going to, where do you live? I live in Ridgeland. Okay. 
Now on June 7th of 2021, were you on call? I was. Okay. How far is it from Ridgeland uh, to here? 45 minutes to an hour, depending on traffic and what part of Colleton County I'm going to. Did you receive a call to respond to a dumb, double homicide? I did. Okay. And where was that? Where were you supposed to respond? Okay. Um, initially to the scene, uh, 4147 Moselle Road. But due to my long commute, it was better that I stopped at the sheriff's office first and I be the one to prepare the search warrant for the property. And who were you coordinating with during that? I mean, who was your boss? That's Captain Jason Chapman. And after you'd received the call, did you confer with Captain Chapman? I Captain. did. Okay. And a result of, as a result of that, what did you do? I went to the sheriff's office, prepared the search warrant, was finally able to track down a magistrate. I had to wake him up out of his bed <laughs> to sign the warrant, and um, I was able to secure a search warrant for the property. Okay. And for 4147 Mazelle? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> what did you do after you got the search warrant? I notified everybody over the radio that I had the search warrant signed because I wasn't sure if the sled crime scene unit was waiting on me. Um, and it was still going to take some time to get out there. And then I made my way to 4147 Moselle Road with the warrant. Had you been out there before to 4147 Moselle? Never. Um, when you went out there, did you know what your role was going to be as you were going out there? I did not. When you got to the scene, uh, tell us what happened. So when I pulled up, I noticed there were several um, sled agents as well as Colleton County deputies um, at the scene. I was basically the last one there. Um, and I met with my supervisor, Captain Jason Chapman, and presented them with the search warrant as well as sled. Um, he asked me if I knew the Murdoch family, to which I replied, I, I did not. They then asked me if I was familiar with a boat accident that had happened in Beaufort, and my reply was, I've heard of it, but I don't know the details. So with that information, they said, okay, you're going to be assigned as the liaison with the lead sled agent on the case, who was identified as Senior Special Agent David Owen, and that my task was going to be to assist him with anything he may need that, that evening at the scene and throughout the investigation. And I think we've heard prior testimony, but the case was turned over to SLED for a, because of a potential conflict. Is That's that correct. That, that was one of the things my captain advised me of when I arrived at the search warrant. He advised me that SLED was going to be the lead agency on the case. And did you know Special Agent David Owens prior to that night? I did not. Okay. But you, did you get to know him and actually get to work with him? So I did, yes, sir. And let's start out with that job. When you first got to 4147 and you got your instructions, who were you going to work with? What were your observations? Tell these folks what you saw. So um, the first thing as I approached the, I'm sure you've all heard the kennels, um, was the overwhelming smell um, and a lot of water on the ground by the kennels. And then the first body that I approached was the deceased male. He was laying face down at an angle with his feet inside the plane of the door. There was obvious um, trauma to the top of his head. He was covered with a sheet, but I could still see the top of his head from underneath the sheet. Um, obvious trauma, there was brain, blood, hair, skull matter, all within the feed room and the ceiling. Uh, there was a deceased female, uh, approximately 30 feet um, across from where his body was, and she was um, covered as well. But um, I had been told that they both had uh, gunshot wounds to their heads. And then from there, we uh, located the 911 caller, um, Mr. Alec Myrtle. Now, did you know, if I was referring to as Paul and Maggie, did you know Paul Myrtle and or Maggie Myrtle? I did not. Had you ever seen them before you saw them laying dead on the ground? No. <coughs> At that point, did you walk any of the rest of the scene? Not at that point. Okay. Well, tell the folks what you did do after that. We located uh, Mr. Murdoch, Alec, um, standing at the back of the, there was his um, <coughs> suburban, and then there was, um, I believe his brother Randy had arrived at the scene at that point. 
and they were standing behind Randy's truck, oh, so they couldn't see the scene anymore. So we approached him and asked if he would speak with us. Um, he introduced the man standing next to him as his personal attorney, Danny Henderson, and he agreed to speak with us. Um, by this point, it had started to rain, so we utilized Agent um, Owen's um, vehicle to do the interview. Now, before we get to that, that you, had you made any other observations about bullet holes or shell casings prior to that? Yes, there were shell casings um, in front of Maggie's head area and front to the left on the ground in between there was like a gravel area in between the two buildings had you um, seen what's been referred to as the feed room and yes okay what did you observe in there anything uh, inside the feed room I did observe um, body matter that had been on the ceiling as well as covered in items inside the feed room there was a shotgun wadding on the on the floor inside the feed room as well as uh, droplets of blood on the concrete. Did you see any holes in the window? Yeah, there was a, a window to the back of the feed room that had several holes in it. I'm going to skip. I want to skip the statement for a second, all right? Mm -hmm. After you took the statement, I, we're going to get into that. Did you go back and um, look at the scene with either Captain Chapman, and I say the scene, scene the, the shelters, the dog kennels, did you and or Captain Chapman or anybody else have an opportunity to go back and look? I did. Okay. T t tell the ladies and gentlemen, first of all, why you did that and what were your observations, please, ma'am? Well, it was such a large scene. Um, I decided to canvas the outer part of the scene. And while I was doing that, <clears throat> keep in mind it was, it was late at night, it was dark, so we had flashlights. So while I was doing that, um, I noted some what appeared to me to be fresh shoe impressions in a sandy part of the shed on the left side of the hangar, what we're describing as the hangar. Um, in between some tractors and the wall of the shed, there was several um, fresh shoe impressions. And when you say fresh shoe impression, kind of obvious, but what does that mean? It, it means that they have been left fairly recently. What did they appear to you to be? They look like a flat sandal flip-flop type shoe, not particularly large in size, just yeah. flat. Were they one set of footprints or two based on your observation? It was one set of prints that looked like it went down one direction and possibly came back. No doubt about that in your mind? No doubt about so that. So if you watch me know, was it like one set of prints going this way? Yes. And then it looked like one set of prints coming back this way? Yes, because they did overlap each other a little bit. And um, did you, and who was with you when you were looking at this? I was by myself initially, and then I found my um, supervisor, Captain Chapman, and, and showed him what I had found. Where were y'all walk, walking when you were looking at the prints? We had made the decision at that point due to the type of incident that it was and we didn't really know what we had yet to follow the footprints and see if there was any other additional evidence and find out where that person may have been trying to go. So what we did is we stayed to the left side of the shoe prints closest to the tractors and, and followed the, the prints down, noted that they stopped at the end of the building, turned around and came back. And I'm going to show you what's entered the States 194. Is that what you're just referring to? No. Okay. What does this depict? That depicts um, several what appear to be boot prints on as well. Is this the same path y'all walked? Yes. Okay. And let me show you. Page 195, do you recognize this? Yeah, those are the, the flat, the flat, just the flat ones, impressions. Okay. I promise you I can't, can we start now, Mom?
show you what's marked states 22. Do you recognize this and does it relate to your testimony? Yes, it does. Your Honor, states 22 without objection. No objection. Submit it. Are we on? Okay. Let me go back to what's just been entered as states 22. You said you recognize that. What is that, Detective? That's in front of the hangar, the building. So Maggie would be to the right, and the shoe impressions I'm referring to would be on the left. And, and getting a little closer view on States 194. Yes, that's the left side of the hangar. Can you show in this picture the prints you were talking about, the footprints? Yes. And, and, and uh, can, can you come down here with the judge's permission? Yeah. Sure, please. These flat ones. Hard to see, there's a big flare. Okay, and let me put in states um, 195 too, Detective. Yeah, these, these flat impressions, these flat ones, can you all see? Were those the foot impressions you saw that night, the flat ones? Yes. Okay. Were there any other foot impressions beside the flat ones that you saw? No. Okay. On evening of June 7th, early morning of June 8th of 2021? That's correct. You're positive? Positive. And again, when you and the captain walked, how far were you from the sandals? A foot to the left. Don't take this any bad way. But could some of those other prints be yours or the captain's? Or you don't it's know? possible. Okay. <laughs> now, you were a... Um, and, and I'm going to do this without putting it up. This is one of those pictures that we've uncovered, but I'm going to show you states seven. You're a lady? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, you know what women's shoes look like? Yes, sir. Did you go and look at Maggie's shoes she was wearing? I did. Okay. Why'd you do that? To see if they matched the flat impressions I had seen. And were they similar to you? Very similar, yes. Okay. And states 200, do you recognize those? Yes. And what are those? Those are the sandals Miss Myrtle had on. And did they appear to be similar to the footprints you saw? Yes, very. Now, did Mr. Harpootlin or one of the investigators contact you about these footprints? He did. When was that? A few weeks ago. And uh, did they send you a picture of it? They did. Okay, was it the pictures we just put up? It was. And did you tell them that, well, what did you tell them when they sent you that? That those were not my impressions. That those weren't your impressions? The Correct. Mm -hmm. Volunteering to talk to them? I did. Sent you a picture of the shoes? I, yep. You told them? Those weren't mine. Correct. All right, let's get back to, uh, I think you said, Mr. Uh, on the defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch, the defendant had said, introduced you to who before you started the interview? Danny Henderson said he was his personal attorney. His personal attorney. Yes. Did he want his attorney in the car with you? He did. Okay. And uh, I believe you said it was raining? Yes, sir. Okay. So what did y'all do to get out of the elements? We sat inside um, Agent Owens with SLED inside his vehicle. And please tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury specifically where everybody was sitting. Agent Owen was in the driver's seat. Alec Murnau was in the front <coughs> passenger seat. I sat directly behind him. And then Mr. Henderson sat to my left. Please listen to me. 
First time was that the first time you met Alex Murdoch? It was. Did he appear to you to be under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or any other intoxicant when you saw him? He did not. Did he appear to you to understand your questions and uh, Special Agent David Owens' questions when y'all were talking to him? He did. Were his answers to either you or Agent Owens timely? Yes. Were they subject matter appropriate? Yes, they were. Did you have any trouble understanding the defendant when you were talking to him? I did not. Did he appear to have any trouble understanding you in responding to your questions? He did not. He may have asked twice to repeat a question, but he was understanding what was being discussed. I'm going to show you what's marked stage 153. At my request, did you review this yesterday? I did. And does this states one fact 53 accurately reflect the interview you, Agent Owens, had with the defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch? It does. Your Honor, at this time, 153, I believe without objection. No objection. Let's admit it. <clears throat> and with this honor's permission and with the help of someone, we'd ask to respectfully publish. Sound. Is that the defendant, Alex Murdoch? It is. Is that you back in the back? That is me. Who is that? That is Special Agent Owen. <laughs> Who is that? Danny Henderson. All right, sir. So, um, Alexander Murdoch. I can see his brain. 
them and having any problems out here? Trespassers, none people that, breaking in? None that I know of. The only thing that what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago. And there's been a, you know, he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver. There's been a lot of negative publicity about that. And there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff. But when Paul's out and about, I mean, people routinely, I don't think I know the full story. Um, so I don't think they give it to me. But I mean, he's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot. So, you know, but I mean, nothing like this. Yeah. Any, any one person in particular or a group of people I don't know. that you could think of? It's not that I know, I'm sure. Has he received, other than being assaulted, has he received any direct threats related to the boat accident? Oh, yes. All the time. He Re gets recently? Um, yes, sir. I mean, he gets them all the time. Okay. He gets them all the time. <coughs> <clears throat> what kind of, I mean? I'm gonna kick your ass, you know. I, I've never been privy firsthand, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Is that through social media? No, ma'am. It's mostly like if, if he goes out places, is what, you know, what <coughs> goes out like somewhere. He's in college, so he goes out. Is what I understand. Mm -hmm. I can find out better details from some of his younger friends on that. Who's his best friend? Uh, um, his best friend in Colombia is is um, Will Chapman, Will Loving, um, Bobby Boyle. Bobby Ball, Will Chapman, and Paul were getting ready to move into a house together in Columbia. You said, um, you said Will Chapman and Will Loving? Will's, Will's with an S, okay. Chapman, and Will with an L, Loving. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, around here, his best friends are Clearly, Nolan Tootin and Rogan Gibson. Tootin? Nolan Tootin? Yes, sir. And what was the other one, I'm sorry? Rogan Gibson. Have you talked with any of these guys tonight? Talked with Nolan, yes, sir. Is he out here? Yes, sir. Okay. I tried to call Rogan was one of the people that he's the boy that I told you lives okay. around the corner. Okay. That's very, you know, he's just a good, healthy young man. You mind if I open the door real door, quick? Door, door. Do what you need to do. Uh, uh. So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of <coughs> off the top of my head, okay. you know? Um, I mean, this is such a stupid thing. I'm even embarrassed to say it, but it just didn't make any sense. I just hired a guy out here, mm -hmm. and he's really, he wasn't cutting the mustard, but I hadn't told him this yet. Paul's been working with him a lot. He killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently, which is why Paul was here doing this. He told Paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school, he got in a fight with some black guys. And the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical black Panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so freaking. 
Yeah, that's kind of far fetched story. Disappeared. But he was off today. Okay. He took his daddy to the dock. What's his name? C. B. Rudd. R. O. W. E. Yeah, and I sent him a message to text me earlier today about the sunflowers, and he called me back when I was on the way to my mom's house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you talk to him at that time? Briefly, I was on the phone with a lawyer friend of mine named Chris Wilson from Bamberg, so I told him I'd call him back tomorrow, see him in the morning. When you briefly talked to um, Mr. Rowe, what was his demeanor or attitude? Or... I mean, it's normal. I mean, I asked him about the sunflowers and so, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's a little bit. Where does he live? I don't exactly know. Somewhere in Bluff, I mean in Bronson. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have his phone number? I do. You got it with you, please, I do. <coughs> you know, but I do think him and Paul got along pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, that's just really, really weird. All right. Um, <coughs> CD. Right there, you glad. Yeah, I know he called me so I'll do that. Tell that story to Paul. Uh, sometime last week. Okay. Sometime last week. Um, my son Paul actually I really do not think in all honesty that it's him, but I know you don't have to check it out, but So taken aback by it that he sent, I'll find it, I got it on my phone. He, he recorded him saying bits and pieces of it. Because he has 
his job to so, you know, he would, I was a real tough man's man. Mm -hmm. You know, he would just. He would defend himself, but he hadn't been. That's right. But, How was he handling As far as what? How was he handling it? I've never been prouder of him than the way he has handled the pressures and the adversity in that situation. I think I've told Danny that before. I mean, Paul is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful kid. He can do almost anything. He gets along with almost anybody. <coughs> Do y'all store any weapons out here? Um, we don't store them, but they're, you know, they're frequently out here. Mm -hmm. I need to find out if there were any out here because I know there was a shotgun. There was a 12 gauge shotgun out here. Uh, <coughs> I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a uh, camouflage. Um, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here okay. recently. But I'm not positive. And the, the shotgun that you had when the deputies pulled up, where did that gun come from? I went to the house and I got a gun, probably overreacting, but... And it, was that when you pulled up and saw them? And, and no, I, I mean, I came out and, I mean, I called 911 first mm -hmm. and talked to them for a little while and then I told her... I told her? That I was that I was going to go to the house. Okay. And that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun. Okay. Do you happen to have any list of all your guns? I can make one. I don't have one. Yeah. But I can make one. Okay. Well, I'm just saying, you know, so we can compare if that shotgun was out here and now it's missing. Absolutely. Um, try to figure, figure that out. No, absolutely. And I know living out here in the country, you probably have more than one or two. We do. We probably have... 20, 25 guns, yeah. rifles, rifles, pistols. Any rifles? Yes, sir. What kind of rifles? All kinds. Yeah. All kinds. I mean, you name it across the board, we have them. Okay. I mean, they're, all of them we have are, you know, in our hunting room, in our house. My son works for my brother, and he was coming home to deal with the sunflowers. Um, he got here. Uh, he got here pretty early because he and I rode around looking at everything for a good little while, probably 45 minutes to an hour. Um, Maggie had things she did in Charleston, and. Um, she had a doctor's appointment in Charleston, and she got back here. It was fairly late. Was it dark yet when Paul got home? No, Paul got home early. Early, okay. So before dinner time? Or oh, yes, ma'am. Lunchtime? Or? No, ma'am. <coughs> what brother, what um, brother does Paul work for? John Barney. And what does Paul do for him? Everything. Handyman, yes, sir. Was it unusual for Maggie to feed the dogs this time of night or check on them? Oh, no. I mean, she played with those dogs every, all the time. And it's especially common for her to, you know, 
she's been gone for a while to come and let especially two of them out to run. So she pretty regularly comes out here in the evenings? Very regular. Comes out here a lot. I have deer cameras, but none, you know, around, up here. Where are they at? On, on different deer stands. Oh, okay, so deep in the woods. Well, not necessarily deep in the woods. Some of them are in fields. And, okay. Um, but I don't, there's none that, you know, are near here. Okay. <clears throat> um, what doctor appointment? What time did you make this evening? Um, I forget the guy's name. Now he's been having trouble with her. She's been having trouble with her stomach and her tooth. I'm not positive. It was sort of a routine visit, and I can't remember. She told me the name of him, and I can't. I want to say Gordine. Gordine, Gordine. It is um, who I think she saw. So was she back home around supper time? Or, um, or six o'clock, seven o'clock? I don't think she got back quite that early. I think she got back a little bit later than that. Okay. Um, what did you do today? Were you in the office or? No, I was home. I came home, all night and messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house, I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, and I think I texted her. And she's very good about answering the phone, so that was odd, or calling me back. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. And what time was that? What, what time was what? That you sent her a text message. Texted her at 9.08, going to check on him, be right back. And then I texted her at 9.47, that must be when I started to come back. I think I called her before that. But let me make sure. Uh, pretty sure that I called her 9.45. And then I tried to call. And then, no, I think that was riding. I think that might have been riding over there. Ten and three. I mean, my calls were right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when. This is when I, at 
is a case of water. It's not a big deal. Yeah. I got some right here. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. sister and, and the husband of Maggie's sister so that they could go and tell Maggie's parents I felt like they needed to be here in person mm -hmm. and they were going there and calling me so they must not be there yet. Maggie's parents in Somerville? Yes. And she, her mom just had a knee replacement surgery and her dad really has trouble getting around nowadays. Do you have any other children? I do. I have a 24 year old. That's what you said. What's his name? Buster. Well, Richard Alexander Jr. Okay. He goes by Buster. He goes by Buster. Is he your life? He's on his way. Just like he, he just like he is, he were able to move him. Okay. No matter. Okay. And did he help Maggie a lot out here with the animals? He helped everybody with everything. Okay. So it was kind of routine for him to be out here as well. This, this place is his absolute passion. Okay. I tried to turn him and then I tried to, then I checked and then I, I mean, I, I, I think I already did, but I checked him. <coughs> and when you pulled, first pulled into the property, did you come from this direction where all our police cars are, or which way did you come from? I went to the house. Okay. And then I came from the house That's straight to here. Yes, okay. I mean, where my vehicle was mm -hmm. parked, it's probably it's where it was. Okay. Well, no, maybe not mm -hmm. exactly, but it was pretty close because okay. I came back the same route. That's right, because you went back to get your shotgun. When I came okay. back. right now, but you know, we'll certainly be in touch. Um, Thank y'all for everything y'all are doing. So, you know, just to kind of let you know what's going to go on, 
we're going to be out here for quite some time. Um, the coroner will take custody of all of them, Maggie. Can I answer that? Yeah. What? <laughs> no, let me, I, we're finished. Let me come out there where I'll be here when he gets here. Hmm. No, don't let him come up here. <sighs> okay, yeah. I think we're about done. <clears throat> You dispute 1257? No, that sounds correct. <laughs> Would you describe that as an aggressive interview? No. As a part of your investigating procedure, had you listened to the 911 tape prior to this? We did. And you say, we, who's we? Uh, myself and Special Agent Owen. Did you have did you have, uh, can everybody hear me? Speak in the mic, please. Speak in the mic, please, ma'am. Did you have that 911 knowledge uh, in your mind when you were listening to this? Had you I already did. heard it? I, yes. Okay. And uh, on the 911 tape, how long had Alex Murdoch told the 911 operator had been since he'd seen Maggie Murdoch? He's estimated uh, one and a half to two hours. To two hours. Mm -hmm. One and a half to two hours. And on this tape, your interview, what had he said about seeing Maggie? When was the last time he'd seen Maggie Murdoch? Um, that she, about two hours. Did he say he took a nap? He took a nap. Okay. Did he say where he went after that? to check on his uh, mother with Alzheimer's in Hampton. Okay. Did you find that unusual? I did. Why? Just the time of night. Why? With her uh, being an Alzheimer's patient, they tend to be worse at night, so I seemed it was strange to go visit. What time was the 911 call? It was 10. Louder, I'm sorry. Um, I'd have to check my notes. Um, we'll put the check with it. I'm sorry. Okay. It was 10. Ten oh six. 
this interview was 1257? Yes, that's correct. In your interview, in Agent Owen's interview, did uh, the defendant Alex Murdoch tell you he tried to turn Paul over? He did. And did he say whether or not he had tried to check Paul's pulse and R. Maggie's pulse? He stated he tried to check both. What, what did Mr. Murdoch, Alex, the defendant, Alex Murdoch, say about the phone, if anything, that was in Paul's possession? He stated his phone popped out of his pocket. When? When he tried to check his pulse. Did he try to turn him over? That's what he said. looking at his phone. Do you remember that? Correct, yes. Okay. Can you actually see the phone in there and the times and the messages on the video that he's looking at? You can on the bottom left of the screen. Okay. And, and what was that in response to that he was looking at that? When I asked what time he texted Maggie. So you saw those on his phone looking at those when y'all were talking to him in the car? I couldn't see from where I was sitting. But reviewing the video, I could see it. Reviewing the video, did you see it? Yes. I've got a transcript here. But at the end of the video, toward the end of the interview, did Mr. Murdoch say again he tried to turn over? His son, Paul Murdoch. He did. That he tried to check him. That's what he said. And I know I asked you at the first, but I may not have done it too eloquently. Did he first tell you he tried to turn him over? Yes, he did. And I figured it out? Yes. And his cell phone popped out of his pocket. That's correct. And, and, and everybody heard it, but then something with it thinking maybe then I put it back down really quickly, then I went, and it's, you can't really understand the rest of it. Yes. <clears throat> what did you think about the phone popping out? That would seem. The objection sustained. Have you ever moved dead weight? I have. If we could start the Elmo, please. Judge, these are a couple of these pictures that uh, I think they have this on top of it. Just to warn everybody, these are graphic photos. First is number two.
Who's this a picture of? That's Maggie Murdoch. Did the defendant say he checked her bolts? He did. Did he tell you where? He did not. And before I get to it, did the defendant ever tell you he'd been down to the kennels that night in this interview? No. After his nap, where did he say he went? Went to check on his mother in Hampton. Just again, if you keep your computers covered, please. Fence one. I'd like for the detective to come down, please, Judge. Yes. Detective, I'm going to get what you won't block, and I won't block it. Did the defendant tell you he tried to get the pulse of his son, Paul Murdoch? He did. Did he tell you where he tried to get the pulse? He did not, just that he tried to turn him. Say that last he time. He tried to turn him. And he told you he tried to turn him more than once, didn't he? Yes, he did. Judge and lady here on him. How many times did he tell you he tried to turn him? Tw uh, twice. I think you've testified you've tried to lift dead weight, right? I have. Can you describe what's around Paul Myrna? Blood and brain matter. Okay. And if you were to, where are his hands? Underneath his body. If you were to check the pulse of his hands, how would you do it? You would have to try to lift him up and get his arms out from under him. Underneath? Correct. And roll it. Correct. By the way, where's his phone? It's laying on the back side of his shorts. Right there. Popped out, he said. Yes. Is that his brain? That is. Mr. Harpootling said blown out of his head. Correct. If you tried to take the take the pulse at the neck, how would you do it? You would have to try to lift his shoulder to get access to his neck. This way? Correct. Whether you're this way or this way. Right? Correct. Either underneath or under the head. Is that right? Yes. Is that right? Is that yes. Right? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. When you saw Alex Murdoch, when you first came up to him? No, I'm just a minute. I'm about to put Is she going to sit down? Okay. That's fine. Why are you questioning her not in the chair? Well, I'll make sure something again. Okay. Judge, I apologize. I see you just Go back and sit down. Thank you. When you first saw Alex Murdoch, at the did you observe him? I did. Why? Just to make mental notes of what he was wearing and how he looked. What were your mental notes? That he was clean. Say that again. That he was clean. Okay. When you were in the car with him, mm. you were behind him. I was. Okay. Did you observe his hands? I did. Did you see his arms? I did. And when you were out on the side of the road beforehand, did you see his shirt? 
I did. His pants? Yes. His shoes? Yes. Now, when you were at the scene, when you first got there, did you see any footprints in the blood? No. Did you see any knee prints in the blood? No. <clears throat> Anywhere around the body? No. Did you look at his shoes? I did. Okay. What kind of shoes? Alex Murdoch shoes. What kind of shoes were they? They were like an athletic tennis shoe. Did you see anything that appeared to be blood on his shoe? I did not. I want you to look at the ladies and gentlemen of this jury. Did you see what appeared to be blood on Alex Murdoch's hands? I did not. On his arms? No. On his shirt? None. On his shorts? No. On his shoes? I did not. How long was this after the 911 call? Two hours, th two to three hours. All this fresh in his mind? Yes. How would you describe the defendant's hands when you saw him when you were interviewing him? How would you describe his hands? They were clean. Clean. How would you describe his arms? They were clean. How would you describe his t-shirt? Clean. How would you describe his shorts? Clean. How would you describe his shoes? They were clean. Was his phone taken that night, Alex Murdoch? I believe so. You're not sure? I'm not sure, okay. no, sir. So it may not have been taken? Yeah. Now, you were working with this. Um, <coughs> hey, you don't stand up. Ms. David Owens, you were working with this land? Yes. When you, um, after this interview, did you go to the actual house at 4147 now? I did. Okay. Did you go inside? I, just in the foyer, yes. Okay. Um, did Agent Owens go inside? He did. Okay. Were the defendant's shirt, shoes, and pants collected by Agent Owens? Yes. You didn't collect them, he did? I did not. Okay. And those are the same shirt, shoes, and pants he was wearing there? Correct. And Sled got them that night? Yes. Okay. After this, did you assist Sled in some just some things that came up in the investigation? I did. Okay. And I don't believe this would be objective, to, but did you assist him with getting Maggie's car? I did. Okay. Some other cell phone evidence? Uh, search warrants. Um. Were there a search of some of the areas that you attended? In, yes. In and around yes. Down, it, um, Moselle? Correct, yes. Okay. Search of ponds? Yes. Okay. Um, so you assisted to some, you assisted SLED at some point throughout this investigation? Yeah, anytime they needed anything from the sheriff's office, uh, Agent Owen could go through me or my captain, uh, whether it was storing a vehicle as evidence or using our evidence bay to process anything, um, I was there to, to assist in any way that they needed. And did you assist, I guess, in the um, helping with Alex um, Murdoch's car as far as getting anything out of that car? Um, no sled process okay, to that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just listen to my questions, 
I'm not going to leave you. I just want to ask you one final question. Is the individual in this courtroom who told you he tried to take the pulse of Maggie and Paul, is the individual in this courtroom who told you he tried to turn Paul over, told you that once, twice? Is the individual in this courtroom that you took that statement from that we saw in this video in this courtroom, and is the individual you describe as clean from head to toe in this courtroom? Yes, he is. Please point him out for the jury. He's sitting at the defense table wearing a grayish brown jacket and a white shirt. Your Honor, we'd like the record to reflect he is, uh, the, she has pointed out the defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch. It does. Thank you, that's all we have. Ladies and gentlemen, we have you go to the jury room for a break. Please do not discuss the case. Detective Cross, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jim Griffin. Uh, I'm Detective Jim Rutland. Griffin. Rutland. Rutland, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Jim Griffin, and I represent Alec Murdoch. Mm -hmm. um, you had testified on direct examination a moment ago that um, that it was, you believe, somewhat unusual for Mr. Murdoch to go visit his mother as late as uh, 9 06 on a Monday evening. You recall? Testifying, I, I do. And and you were sitting in the car when he was being interviewed, and and you recall him saying that his father, Mr. Randolph Murdoch, had just been put in the hospital that very day. That's correct. And that it was an unusual day, because Mr. Randolph Murdoch was not with Ms. Libby Randolph, and she gets anxious when that occurs. You remember that. I remember him saying okay. something along those lines. And in, in that context, it's you don't criticize a son who goes to visit his mother who has early onset dementia on the very day in the afternoon that the father is admitted to the hospital. You're not here to criticize him for that, are you? No, I didn't criticize. I just made a mental note that that was interesting. Okay. And, and you... Um, You walked the crime scene when you arrived and you made some mental notes and observations that you subsequently recorded in a report, did you not? I did. And one of the things that you mentally noted and then subsequently reported was that there was a tremendous amount of blood spatter in the feed room area and around where Paul was murdered. Is that correct? That's correct. And there was brain matter and organic matter all about the place where Paul was murdered, correct? That's correct. And and I think you even described that there was uh, matter, that blood that went up to the ceiling and to the door and, and spatter everywhere, right? That's correct. And you also told the jury that Alec was clean and you're referring to his shirt was clean, correct? Correct. His shorts were clean, correct? Correct. You remember the litany of Mr. Matters? Shorts, shirts, shoes were clean, correct? That's correct. He was clean, correct? To my visual eye, he was clean, yes. And to your visual eye, it did not look like he had just blown his son's head off in the confines of a feed room where splatter is everywhere. Isn't that correct? I didn't say that. Well, let me ask you, in your mind's eye, that night, on June 7th, did he look like someone had just blown his son's head off, spatter going everywhere? Again, I, I can't say that for sure. A lot, of th a lot of things would come into play to affect that. Distance is one of them. Well, certainly if he appeared that way on the night of June the 7th, you were sworn law enforcement officer, you would have initiated process to take him into custody, I suspect, wouldn't you? No, that was not my role that evening. I was just assisting. Well, one, one of the things you did that evening, Ms. Rutland, was you obtained a search warrant, did you not? I did. And that was your first official <laughs> duty in connection with this double homicide investigation, right? That's correct. And I'm going to show you Exhibit 3, Your Honor. I, I shared it with Mr. Meadows during the break. And um, 
ask the witness to identify it. You recognize exhibit three? I do. This is the search warrant. I got that night. Your Honor, we'd move exhibit three into evidence this time, I believe, without objection. No objection. It's admitted. I have it. So tell the jury, please, uh, exhibit three is. Well, well, first, let's just talk about a search warrant. What is a search warrant? It grants us the right to, to search a certain item that may be potential evidence in a case. And, and this search warrant uh, was for what property? 4147 Moselle Road in Islandton, County of Colleton, State of South Carolina. And, and it covers the whole roughly 1,700 acres of the whole property, does it not? That is correct. And it covers the house, the, the residence where you went into the foyer, right? Correct. It covers all the outbuildings, correct? Correct. And it covers, um, and it gives you the right to seize um, any type of evidence, correct? That is correct. Let me see if I can get Mr. Elmo to work. Can you turn it on, please? I've got to turn sideways. All right. See if we can read that document. Mm. Can is there light in front of you? That's much better. And can we zoom in? All right. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So, it, and this is the search warrant, right? Yes, it is. And it says description of premises uh, to be searched, and here it's 4147 Moselle Road, Islandton. And then there's a PIN number. What, what's the PIN number? That's a property identification number that's assigned to every parcels of real property within the county. It's set by the tax office. It says the property to be searched are any residences, vehicles, outbuildings, kennels, or sheds, right? That is correct. Okay. And then it says uh, the description of the property to, uh, to search and to, and to be seized. And that's under the description of property, right? Correct. And you prepared this document for the magistrate to sign? I did. And here um, says evidence that may be used or taken during the commission of a crime of homicide to include but not limited any item, tool, clothing, gloves, masks, hats, hoodies, shoes, boots, jewelry, firearms, ammunition, shell casings, gunshot residue, weapons, identification documents, any paperwork, etc. Um, it says any evidence inside vehicles on the property, any evidence found on, in outbuildings or sheds, any tire, shoe impressions, any and all DNA to include but not limited to fingerprints, touch DNA, etc. Any drugs, narcotics, drugs, paraphernalia, any and all cellular phones, phone records to include incoming, outcoming calls, text messages, voice messages, etc. And it goes on to talk about photographs and whatnot. It's all encompassing, isn't it? It is. And th this is basically as broad of a search warrant that, that you draft because it's a homicide investigation and it gives you carte blanche on the property of the crime scene, correct? That's correct. And with the search warrant, you had the authority to go in the house and look for unclean, dirty clothes, did you not? <clears throat> that was, I wasn't in that capacity that evening. I was assisting. Well, the search warrant provided that authority to law enforcement, did it not? It, it would have, yes. And you mentioned that you got into uh, the law enforcement business because you're CSI TV junkie of sorts. <laughs> did I understand you say that? Yeah, I was. Okay, and, and, and you've seen CSI shows where they go and they, they look in the drains of showers or sinks and to see if blood residue had been recently flushed through there. That's possible, is it not? It could be. And that's just not on TV. I mean, that's, that's skills that SLED's um, crime team has available to them, correct? I don't know what they have available, but okay. that would be a crime scene unit question. Right. The, um, 
And, and actually there were the, the clean clothes that Alec Murdoch was wearing that night, they were seized, were they not? Yes. Okay, and the clean shoes were seized, correct? Yes. And the clean shirt was seized, was it not? Yes, it was. Okay. And, but that, you were in the house when that happened, but you didn't collect the clothes, right? I did not collect anything. I stood by in the foyer. And who did the collection, do you recall? Special Agent Owen. And when, was he assisted by anybody? I was just standing by. I, they went to a back bedroom and I was in the foyer area. It was like an open floor plan. And, and do you recall how, uh, uh, do you recall what Mr. Owen, Detective Owen, Special Agent Owen, apologize, Detective Owen, uh, Special Agent Owen, did uh, you uh, observe what he collected the clothes in? I did not. Did, it, did he collect all the clothes and put them in one paper bag? I don't recall. Now, the jury heard the complete video audio of the interview with Alec Murdoch on the evening, of early morning hours of, of June the 8th, and yet you were asked to uh, repeat some of the things that he said, and, and, and I, want, I want to, I mean, the tape speaks for itself, I don't want anyone to miss construed your testimony, so I just want to ask you, are you saying that Mr. Murdoch tried to turn his son over two times on that tape, or that on two occasions he described one incident that he tried to turn his son over? The latter that he explained twice, two different times. So, so in answer to your questions, if anyone would walk away thinking that, that Alan Murdoch told you that he tried to turn him over two times, that would just be mistaken and we've now clarified it, right? Correct. Okay. Now, you never asked, or Special Agent Owen never asked Mr. Mur Murdoch how he tried to turn his son over, correct? That's all. Correct. And, and so, you see Mr. Matters crawling around on the floor down here as trying to reenact something. Uh, but that night, he never was asked specifically, what did you do to try to turn your son over, correct? That's correct. We did not ask that. And that night, he was not asked specifically how the phone popped out of his pocket while you were trying to turn him over, correct? Correct. And that night, he was not asked specifically how far were you able to move um, Paul, if at all, when you tried to flip him over, correct? Correct. And in, in fact, did he really even say that I was trying to flip him over to check his pulse? I'd have to check the transcript, but I, I believe he said something along those lines. Well, did he tell you where he tried to check Paul's pulse? He did not. So we don't know from your interview, or Special Agent Owen's interview, how he tried to turn him over, how the phone popped out, well, at least how Alec describes it, because he wasn't asked, and where on Paul's body he attempted to check his pulse, correct? Correct. And, and you were asked questions about whether there were knee prints and footprints by Paul's body next to his body, right? Yes, I was asked that. And, and, and did you do such a forensic analysis or investigation to see if there were boot prints or footprints around Paul's body? I looked with my eyes. Okay. And were you aware that before you got there, well, let me, what time did you get there? 
Can I check my notes? Sure. Okay. You can take this down. Through Mr. Elmer. I think I'm through for now. Okay. Okay. Twelve twenty two AM I was on scene. Okay, twelve twenty two AM. And and Paul's body and Maggie's bodies were covered up with a sheet, but still present, correct? Correct. So when you were looking at Paul's body, just observing whether there are footprints near him, you couldn't see right next to his body because of the sheet, could you? The sheet was mostly on his body, not on the cement on the ground next to the body. Was it a fitted sheet? No, but it wasn't a queen sheet either. Okay. Then the jury has seen photos of the sheet. Um, were you aware that Captain Chapman and others went around Paul's body and lifted the sheet up to see if there was a gun underneath him? Not at the time I was at the scene, no. Well, I take it you did not observe their footprints anywhere in the area either then, right? Not that I recall. And you said that um, Alex's pants were clean. Remember saying that? I remember saying that. What color pants did he have on? Khaki. All right. And are you aware of any forensic testing that had been done to the pants to see whether there was blood on the pants? That night? Subsequently? No, there was nothing done that night forensically. That night nothing was done forensically? Not before I interviewed him, no. Right. And you just did not observe any blood on his pants or in his pocket? No, just simply speaking with him like this, looking him up and down, I did not see any blood on him. And he didn't look like someone who had just been within feet of blowing Paul's head off, right? Again, I can't say that. There's so many different factors that you would have to take into account. Now, you did a lot more I believe that night a after you left well let's go back when, when you got to the scene you partnered up with Agent Owen correct that is correct and, mm -hmm. um, and and you saw inside the shed and you observed there was wadding on the floor near his feet Paul's feet correct and when you say wadding, what are you talking about? The internal components of a shotgun shell. And then you saw in the rear window of the shed, there were several holes, right? That is correct. And you described in your report that you saw large amounts of blood spatter and brain skull matter were on the door to the shed and the items within the storage building. You saw all that, right? That's correct. And then you, you went and examined Maggie's body, did you not? I wouldn't say examined. I would just say I, I looked at her. And well, one of the things that you noticed when you were looking at <coughs> Maggie's body, um, I, I believe, you said you noticed there are a few clumps of her hair and a broken earring were located near a UTV tire, right? That is correct. And what's UTV tire? <coughs> I'm sorry? What do you mean by UTV? Uh, All-terrain uh, all -terrain vehicle, it's like a four-wheeler, side-by-side. And did um, 
And we talked, to, you talked about these foot impressions that, that you observed, right? I did. Um, and I said I was done with Mr. Elmo, but I'm not. Can we put these back up, please? Can you turn on Elmo? It's on. Oh, there it is. How do you zoom in, Doug? Let's just change the color. Make it light. Okay. All right. I think I think that's good. Okay. Hang on. Not be a good one. That's okay. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that that you told investigators that that work for me and Mr. Harputlian that that the boot prints were not yours in these photos, right? That is correct. But now you told the jury that the boot prints are yours. That's incorrect. Those are not my boot prints. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Whose boot prints are they? I don't know. Oh, so I'm, okay. I'm, that's why I get to do this. So Objection to these comments. Here's some exposed questions. So you don't know whose boot prints those are? No. Okay. All right. Now, one thing about the search warrant that I asked you about earlier, um, it was, do you have it up there? I, I couldn't remember if I gave it back to you or no, not. I don't think you did, okay. that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it was never executed, was it? Sorry, it's in the middle. Oh. Uh, your phone? I handed this off to sled agents once I was at the scene, thank you. You said you handed the search warrant off to sled agents. I did. Okay. But to your knowledge, was it ever executed? Yes, it was. Oh, you think it was executed? It was. And why do you say that? Because the sled crime scene unit, I was present while they were processing the scene and executing the search warrant. And, and so there, there are two ways that law enforcement can get access to property. One is through a search warrant and one's by consent. Is that right? That's correct. Now, are you aware that Mr. Murdoch gave SLED, Colleton County, any law enforcement, FBI, carte blanche consent to search his property? That wasn't relayed to me. I was asked, tasked with getting a search warrant, so I did. Okay, and, and once a search warrant is executed, a return is filed with the magistrate who issued it, right? That's correct. And you, you never filed a return on that search warrant, right? Do you have, um, it, like I said, it was given to SLED, so. Okay. So we'll find out more about that. But to your knowledge, I mean, you didn't file a return. That's all you can say, right? I don't recall. I have to check my notes. Uh, you heard on uh, the tape, you heard Mr. Murdoch say, you can uh, you can do anything, look for anything. Do you remember him just giving consent to whatever you need? As far as um, speaking with him, yes, I remember him saying that. Okay. And and so, and you walked back through the crime scene one last time before you cleared the area on the morning of the eighth. Is that right? You could say that. We were, I mean, we were walking around the whole night and staying out of the way of the crime scene unit. Was it, was it 
Were you there after the crime scene unit left? No, I was not. They were still processing when I left. Okay. Do you know whether or not the, um, the crime scene unit left um, shotgun pellets I have behind at the, in the feed room? I have no knowledge of any of that. 20, 30, even more shotgun pellets left behind in the feed room. Honest, were you aware of that? Said she had no objection. Objection is sustained. On Thursday, June 10th, two days, three days, Thursday, June the 10th, um, you went with SLED, a number of SLED agents and law enforcement agents went to meet with Mr. Murdoch, Mr. Murdoch's brothers, Randy and John Marvin, Mr. Murdoch's son, and they all agreed to, to meet and y'all found a location in outside of Barnville, I believe. You remember doing that? I do, I remember doing that. And that was, uh, during that, I, I believe you and, um, and a sled agent interviewed Mr. Randy Murdoch, correct? That's correct. And Mr. Randy Murdoch agreed to allow the download of his cell phone, correct? That's correct. And gave consent, right? He did. And Mr. Alec Murdoch, to your knowledge, gave consent to download his cell phone, correct? To my knowledge, yes. And Mr. John Marvin Murdoch did the same, correct? Correct. And Mr. Buster Murdoch did the same, correct? He did. And everyone gave a voluntary interview that day, to your knowledge, right? They did. And then um, a little bit later on the Wednesday, June 16th, um, you assisted SLED when they went out to the Moselle property and went diving, uh, searching for, uh, well, let me ask you, when you assisted SLED dive team, or well, did you assist SLED dive team on June 16th, 2021? I did. And with a search of the Moselle property, focusing on waterways, ponds, the South Kahatchee River access points for evidence from the crime, correct? That's correct. Were you looking for the firearms that were used to murder Maggie and Paul? We were looking for anything that could have been linked to their murders. And then you utilize ATVs and canvas the entire 1,700 acres of land? I did, that was my assignment that day. And once again, that was done with consent by Mr. Murdoch, correct? That is correct. <laughs> and then went back the next day um, and, and dove another pond on the property. You remember doing that? I didn't dive, but I was standing by, yes. You were there? <laughs> yes. And again, that was with consent, right? Correct. And then you were uh, given consent and you did a search of a white F-250 pickup that, um, that Paul normally drove, right? That is correct. And while you were there, Mr. Davis shows up, and Mr. Davis, you understood to be the caretaker for the dogs, right? Yes, that's what he explained his job title was at Moselle. And that, uh, did you observe him doing his work that day? I did. Did you watch him wash down the um, dog runs? I don't remember that part. But you were able to look at his tire marks and make an assessment as to whether they appeared to match the tire marks that were seen under the shed portion next to the, the old airplane hangar, right? That's correct. He, he parks under the canopy next to the UTV. And then on Friday, June the 18th, um, you had a meeting and you, you looked at uh, some photos, I believe crime scene photos and autopsy photos at SLED, correct? 
I did. And you made a mental note and you put it in your record that, that you noticed a few strands of what appeared to be brown hair unable to determine the length from the photo in Maggie's hands and fingers, right? That is correct. And you thought that that possibly was an indication of a struggle, that Maggie had grabbed someone, had their hair in her hands, right? I didn't say that in my report, no. Well, so why did you note it in your report? Because it was an observation. Okay. Well, you also noticed uh, in your report that there were some injuries what appeared to be to Paul's face, that like he had been um, <coughs> some type of struggle, right? I noted what, what to me could have been scratches or a bruise on his cheek. And, and we heard some testimony yesterday about uh, a bolo on the lookout for uh, a white pickup that Paul normally drives. I mean, that pickup was found the next morning, correct? That's correct. It was broken down. Yeah, and, and you learned through your investigation that Paul had switched vehicles with his uncle John Marvin and John Marvin was rushing to Moselle when he got the phone call in Paul's truck and it broke down on the side of the road. Yeah, that's correct. It was, uh, Mr. I believe, Mr. Randolph struggled to get in and out of the truck. Did Colony County Sheriff's Office put out a statement to the press on the morning of June the 8th that there's no need to public to be alarmed? I don't believe that came from our office. Uh, it did not come through CID for approval. I never seen that press release. So let, was Alec Murdoch, your assisting sled, um, night of June the 7th, morning June the 8th, was Alec Murdoch a suspect. That night everybody was a suspect. Everybody? Can you be more specific? Who else were suspects besides? Well, there was reasons we were asking certain questions. Who his best friend is, who, you know, their, their routine each day. There were so many different scenarios it could have been that night. So, in my view, everybody was a suspect at that point. Including Alec? Including Alec. Do we have the exhibit number that's in evidence that before we play it?
Your Honor, we're going to play a portion of Exhibit 1. Um, we need to cover our screens. It is a um, portion of since this matter. <laughs> Can you see that, um, Ms. Rutland? I can, yes, sir. Okay. Well, let's just stop right there. You see how far that sheet is on either side of Paul's body there? At this point in time, yes, I see how it looks. Is, is that how roughly how far it was across Paul's body when you got there? No, because I could still I could see the top of his head. Well, I'm talking about uh, the the width of his body. Was it that far across? I don't recall how it was because I could I could see parts of his body, but okay. it was still on him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will you go ahead and play? Okay. Did you notice any footprints of the agent there inside the kennel? No, I believe he's standing on the in the food room. In the feed room. Right. No. Right. But it was uh, starting to rain. Can you stop right there, please? Can, can you back it up just five seconds? Yeah, and play it. Okay. As soon as it goes down, uh, a little bit further. All right, please stop. Was that how far across the sheet was when you observed Paul's body? I don't remember. Like I said, when I got there, there was uh, sled agents as well as deputies standing around the scene, and I wasn't sure what had happened before I got there. I don't recall how the sheet was. Well, was the sheet on Paul's body the entire time you were walking the crime scene? No, eventually it was removed when the crime scene unit was ready to process his body. And the, uh, I just want to clear up. When you said... Alec was wearing khakis. Were you referring to shorts or long pants? Shorts. Is, it, is this from the video we just, from the interview? Your Honor, we're going to publish a small portion of the, um, of the video in the car, which is their last exhibit. Well, excuse me, that's, that's from number one. Those are shorts he was wearing? Yes. Are those khakis or green? Khaki style, green. <laughs> okay. All right. That's all. You can take it then. That's all the questions we have, Your Honor. Can you read that right? Yes, sir. Mr. Griffin asked you about some things you did after your interview the following days. He did. And you had mentioned a search warrant was executed. Were you working with SLED after June 8th? He's asked you about them. And did you work with them in executing search warrants? I did. Specifically on June 9th. Um, 
And you were, who were you working with? Special Agent Owen. And I think Mr. Gr did Mr. Griffin ask you there was a truck on the side of the road that went back to a brother, John Marvin? That's correct. So that was the white truck? Yes. That was on the side of the road? Yes. And it belonged, who did it belong to? John Marvin. Okay, and that was off the property of myself? That's correct. Okay. So that has nothing to do with this case as far as suspect and this killing does? No, it did so. not. We processed to rule it out. What was that last thing? We processed it to rule it out. Okay. And, and he asked you about meeting with these folks and then talking to you. You were working with SLED doing that, weren't you? I was. SLED was <laughs> investigating this case? Yes. Getting swabs. Getting swabs from folks? In general, yeah. getting swabs? I was present when swabs were taken, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not trying to say yeah. you took them. I'm no. just following up on his That's question. correct, yeah. Were you present when interviews were taken? So I was well. present, yes. Okay. And who was leading those interviews? SLED. Who was in charge? SLED. Were they investigating? They were investigating. Did you assist SLED with the initial timeline on phone calls? I did. On June 12th, did you assist SLED in removing an internal computer black box of a Chevy Suburban? I did, by standing by. On June 14th, did you assist SLED in obtaining a search warrant for Maggie Murdoch's Mercedes? I did. And was Lieutenant Kent in charge of that? He was. He was SLED investigating? SLED was investigating. Was that what's referred to as the blue box? Black box, I Black believe. Box. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Were well, you with SLED when Maggie Murdahl's Mercedes was towed? I was. Did y'all have a search warrant for that? We did. I think he asked you, did you, were you with SLED when ponds were searched in the area? I was. That's, that's June 16th, would you dispute that, 2021? No, that's correct. And I think Mr. Griffin asked you about a truck that a Mr. Davis was driving out of the shed. Were you able to confirm that the tire tracks in the shed were his? I did, by looking at them. By looking at them? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think Mr. Griffin asked you, did Mr. Davis say he was in and out of there a couple times a day? Twice a day, yes. So those tracks inside the shelter were whose? The, the dog caretaker, Mr. Davis. And I think he asked you about water. Just remind me, the night you were there, did you see water around the bodies? I did. He asked you about some injuries, I think, that you had noted in your report. How did Paul fall? Face down at an angle outside the feed room. On what? On his hands and arms. Okay, but his face hit what? The gravel. <clears throat> Mr. Um, Griffin asked you about how many times the defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch, had mentioned to turn his son Paul's body <coughs> on page two of the transcript or toward the front. Actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. You remember him saying that? Yes. You know, I tried to turn him over and I, I don't know, I figured it out. Yes. And uh, his cell phone popped out. Correct. And I tried to do something. Mm-hmm thinking maybe, but then I put it back down? Correct. Were his words, I think I tried to turn him over. Yes. And later on, I tried to turn him, and then I tried to check him. Correct. I tried to turn him. Correct. He asked you about the sheet on the body. Did you see the front or the top of Maggie's, oh, excuse me, Paul's head? I did. Okay. And he asked you about the sheet over that body. I want to ask you about the sheet. When you saw Richard Alexander Murdoch 
Did he have a sheet over him? He did not. Could you see his face, his hands, his body, his pants, and his shirt? I could. Did he look like somebody who just changed his clothes? Yes. Basis for the objection. Response, Mr. Meadows. I couldn't hear what he said. I'm sorry. No basis for that did those clothes appear to be fresh? They did. Like they just come out of the laundry? They could be. That's all we have. Further questions? Briefly, Your Honor, Detective, it was raining that night, wasn't it? It started to rain before and we did our interview. Can you put up that photo that, that, of his shorts and shirt that we sh saw a minute ago? What's that? Waiting for Oh, here it is. Thanks. So these are the clothes that, that you saw him wearing sitting in the car? Correct. And your testimony, those clothing, that those clothes look like they're freshly washed. He's sweating and they are dry, so I would say yes. Okay. Thank you. You messed up down. 